Hi, Tyler Stallman. Whether you're just getting started with Final Cut Pro or you've been using it for years, this video will have at least one tip and or trick that you're gonna start using every single day. And thanks to Squarespace for sponsoring this video, the best place to host your portfolio online. And let's start at the very beginning by creating a new library. Once again, I'm gonna be using footage we shot for Northwater in the fall. And typically I name my library the same thing as a folder that I put it inside and everything else. And now this brings us to our first tip, which is something that's good to figure out early on when you're using Final Cut is when do you want to create a new library versus adding to an existing one? And I think part of this confusion comes from the language that Final Cut uses. So inside of our library, we will create projects. I'm gonna give my project the exact same name. The word library implies that it's going to hold on to a lot of different projects, like you know, a, a library. But that can get pretty messy in Final Cut. So I would keep the projects inside of your library all related. So they're all sharing footage. Maybe they're all part of the same shoot, but more or less, I have one library per project. Next, I'll show you how I do my file and folder structure. So I did already edit this video, so there is a file structure existing right here. And I will have a folder for videos, images, audio, and inside of video, there can be different either shoot days or cameras, depending on exactly what I'm doing. I like to try to keep it very loosely organized. I know some people use events as the primary way of organizing footage within Final Cut, but I find keywords way more useful. So here, I'm gonna import everything. I am going to leave files in place because I don't like Final Cut managing my files. More about that in a minute. But what I'm gonna do is import the audio, images, and video, and I'm gonna select keywords from folders. This is gonna take the title of each folder and use it as a keyword. So now all of our footage is in the library. And if we open up our event here, you can see that there are a series of keywords. So now our event can be anything. I often don't rename them, but I don't know. We can just name the same things as the project if we want. More importantly, we're now able to really find things. So we had two days of shooting for this commercial and we use two different cameras. So the gimbal shots are shot on the EOS R. So I'm gonna make the browser a little bit bigger here and select day one and day two. And then just by the file name, I can tell these are all of the EOS R videos, select them all, command K to open up keywords. And I'm just gonna call this Canon R. Then with those days still selected, I'm gonna go down and I can tell again by the file name, these are all the C200 files. And you can add as many keywords as you want, but I'd strongly recommend only add the amount that are actually useful to you. So for example, with cameras, these have different log profiles on them, so I have to color grade them differently. So if I select all of my C200 footage, this was shot in Canon Log 2. So if I go into Info, I can select the custom C Log 2 profile that I made, which you can download below. It's based on Alexa LUTs and it looks great. It's my favorite LUT that I've got. And now all the shots are in beautiful Rec 709, full contrast, so they look good again. And I've also got one that I use for C-Log, C-Log 3, and most importantly, a film emulation that I put on virtually every single project, including this one right now. So if you want to download my LUTs, link is in the description below. I'm actually gonna take a little step back, select the library, click Modify Settings, and let's take a look at where we're storing things. So right now, the media is set to be stored inside of the library. If you're storing it in the library, that's how Apple tries to make it easier for you. I really prefer to choose the video folder and keep it all in there. Makes it easier to move files around. Another thing I always do, this caused huge problems for me. It's actually part of the reason I switched to Premiere for a few years until I figured this out. Final Cut can start to take up your whole hard drive if you let it. One way to prevent it is to change your cache location from inside of the library to the root folder of the main project and I put it right there so it is visible to me. And the reason for this is now it is just, it's completely visible. If I click on it, I can see right now it's 27 megabytes, that's nothing. By the end of editing this, it will be hundreds of gigabytes. It will be enormous. And you can just delete it when you're done. You don't actually need to keep the cache file around. You can actually just delete it as you're editing. So whenever I need to clear up hard drive space, I look at completed projects and just delete all those cache files from the finder. The other big thing is that when you are importing your files, make sure that you have a close look at where your files are being copied to, because if you click copy as opposed to leave in place, it'll create duplicates of all of your videos. Same thing goes for create optimized media and I mean, kind of create proxies. Just make sure that you're watching those because you don't want to end up having multiple versions of all the same videos because you can fill a whole hard drive in just a few minutes. 
So to be clear, I never create optimized and I do create proxy media if I'm working with files that slow my computer down, like the R5, R6, A7S III, all these new cameras really can slow down editing. All right, and this next tip, I learned from a friend that does really high-end commercial work for like Mercedes-Benz and Game of Thrones and like all the, all the big stuff. Thomas Grove Carter, he has great tutorials of his own. But the first thing I do when I'm sorting B-roll style footage, which this isn't narrative, none of this stuff connects, but I'm gonna go through everything and like, well, I should go to the start. And I wanna watch every single clip. So you're just kind of checking out what you have. And as you see good moments, you press I, and then when the good part's over, you press O, and now you set an in and out. So if we look over here, there is a yellow section that is selected. Now your first instinct might be to drag this down to the timeline or press the E key and that drops into the timeline. Don't drop it in the timeline yet. The much more useful thing to do is press the F key. Now this favorites it. You can see that there is a small green line above it here. And you're gonna go through watching all your clips. Actually, I see she's got an elastic on her wrist there. We got that off here. Okay, so yeah, let's use these ones. Another favorite. And you can do this really quickly. The big goal here is just to like remove all of the junk. So I'm gonna press I and Oh, in that general section. This whole take is junk, so I'm gonna select it and press delete. If it works better for you, sometimes I use the mouse and just select the good part like this. Good old fashioned click and drag. Oh, and this kid, he ruined the shot. And you're gonna go through and watch every single shot that you took and select your favorite parts of it. Now, why are we doing this? Because at the end, instead of viewing all clips, you can just view favorites. And these are just the sections that we decided are the best. And this can take a few hours, so I'm just gonna quickly show you this is what it looks like on the completed project. So you end up with a lot, like favorite everything you think you might possibly use. So you have a lot of clips to choose from. Anything that doesn't get favorited might get lost in the future and probably won't end up in your final edit. And then a beautiful thing, if you shot things in sequence, which I don't know, we kind of did here, like this is all just B-roll, so there's no real sequence. But if I select everything that is related here in the favorites and I drag them down into the timeline, I like, I basically just have a watchable video now. It's like, it's it's edited. I mean, kind of, uh, this is not the other final thing. So we're gonna have to delete a lot of this. And the reason for all this is it's scalable and non-destructive. So you can always go back and find alternate versions that you liked. You're not like losing stuff, which can happen if you add it straight to the timeline, it's very hard to go back and find another version of a take that you might've liked. If you wanna know more from Thomas Grove Carter, he's been on the podcast a few times and he is a damn genius when it comes to Final Cut Pro. So check out those episodes and check out his tutorials too, great guy. That technique of favoriting everything is really great for B-roll or if your shots are broken up a lot. When I do videos like this that I'm recording right now, it's one long take of A-roll and then I cut that up. So I'm gonna open up a new project. So in this one, I was breaking down my C200 rig and I treat this very differently. So what I do here is I drop the whole thing on the timeline. Here is, you know, beginning to end, all the bloopers and everything in between. And then instead of just starting to cut, the important step is first, I press Option G and create a new compound clip. And this can just be called a roll clip, whatever, like totally doesn't matter what it is. The point is now when you start editing, so I put some, you know, random cuts in here, chop it up, delete something. If I double clip and go inside the compound clip, everything is still there and I can make changes that are now affected all the way through. So for example, this has absolutely no color in it. If I add the saturation back into the log, it is all the way through that whole thing. And this is so helpful for long clips. If you're trying to keep a whole bunch of stuff in sync that was shot at the exact same time, it's way easier when it's inside a compound clip. And this is how I edit things. This might be super basic if you've been editing for a while, but if you haven't seen this yet, it'll change everything for you. Okay, I'm not doing this for real, so it doesn't really matter what I'm saying here. I'm just gonna go through and, okay, uh, I know that this is a first take. And what you might do, the most basic thing, is to select the blade tool with B, cut, then you'd go back to the select tool, click that, and delete it. That's one way to remove things. Now the thing that you should start doing, and hopefully you already have been, is you go to the part of the timeline where you want the clip to start, and you press option, left square bracket, and it will trim, a ripple trim, everything before that point. So then at the end of my take, I will press Command B for the blade tool. It'll just cut things. And then I go to the beginning of the next take. I can tell those are false starts. Uh, I think this is the real one over here. And I press Option, left square bracket, and it will trim everything to the left. Now I could also do that in the other direction. I could go to the beginning of the next take over here, press Command B. And then from here, 
when I start looking at my phone, <laughs> I could press option and right square bracket and it will trim everything to the right. This is essential to being fast in Final Cut Pro. If you are not editing this way, you are probably editing much more slowly. <laughs> And to take that further, I actually go in and I customize all of mine. So if I switch over, you can see I've already saved it. And all that's doing is I've got like trim and trim start. I assign those to just be the left and right bracket without any modification keys because I just use them so much. And now I'm gonna jump back into Northwater here. I've added those favorite clips into a timeline. And let's say I've added everything, but it's a little bit too long. Very important is to create duplicates as you move along. Now, something to keep in mind is the difference between duplicate and snapshot project is something I just learned. I didn't actually know this difference. If you're using compound clips, duplicate will make those compound clip changes propagate through all of the different versions. So if I duplicate this, North Waterfall 1 will have any compound clip changes or multicam clip changes. Whereas if I go snapshot project, now those compound clips live completely on their own. So it depends on how you're structuring things. Snapshots are kind of the safest where you're least likely to screw things up. But as you go along, and especially when you're making shorter edits of your project, be sure to save them by duplicating and snapshotting your project as you go so that you can revert back to earlier changes. And now since we were so organized as we created our project, I've got, I've got a new tip. I just figured this out recently. So as a YouTuber, I create too much footage. Like this is 4K raw that I'm shooting in right now and I do not want to keep all of that. But I do want to keep all of my favorite B-roll shots. So when I'm done editing everything, if it's the kind of project where I can throw the other stuff away, not every project is like that. If you're working for a client, make sure they know if you're supposed to hold on to all the footage or not. But if it's that kind of project where you get to make decisions, you can go and select all your favorite clips here, which is actually not that much footage. Go to file, and send to compressor and it will send eight clips in this case, all to compressor. And I'm going to select all and depending how important the project is, I'll either use ProRes 422 or ProRes LT start batch. And now it's just gonna save my favorite moments of the most important clips. So what I can end up archiving is a really small folder that has everything that I used in the edit plus a little bit more. And it's just, it's really easy to go back and reuse those clips for future YouTube videos. But you've gotta be warned, this can break your Final Cut project because now these are new video files. They won't line up with the ones that you are editing with. So there's some caveats. This is just a way to store B-roll footage. So in my case, I like to create a bit of an archive of older clips that we've shot in previous videos of say products that might show up in future videos, but it's way smaller than holding on to the, all the originals. And I've got one more quick one, but after I thank Squarespace for sponsoring this video, which is the best place to host your video portfolio on the internet. Of course, you can upload to YouTube or Vimeo or Instagram or all sorts of social platforms, but in the end, you don't really own or control those spaces. Squarespace is somewhere that you can completely design the whole website to fit your brand. You can customize the domain name, and most importantly, you have full control forever because you own this website. Their templates and design tools make it just as easy as using a social network to set something up that feels like it's yours and that looks beautiful to your audience, but they won't know that it came from a template because you can customize it so much so easily. Squarespace's SEO and analytics tools are also everything you need to really run a professional website. So let's say you're building a store and you are trying to sell a product. You can keep an eye on every detail of it, both of making sure that people find you online and where they are visiting on your site to make sure you get conversions. There is so much you can do with Squarespace. So go check them out today at squarespace.com. And once you've started a free trial and built a simple website in just a few minutes, then you can go to squarespace.com slash Tyler Stallman and using offer code Tyler Stallman, you can get 10% off your first website or domain. I've been using Squarespace kind of forever and I'm gonna keep using it because their sites are beautiful and easy to use. And thanks again, Squarespace, for sponsoring this video. So I've added some music and voiceover to this clip. But in order to hear it, we're going to have to turn down the music. Now, in the olden days, what I would do is I'd option click to add different points on the audio track, and then I would drag them down. Let's zoom in a little. So now we've got a little fade as it's going. There's a way easier way to do that that I didn't know about till recently. Instead, I use the R key, which stands for range. I select the range of my voiceover and I just drag down on the audio. And now I'm ducking in exactly that spot 
Who knew? I mean, maybe you did. Let me know what great tips I missed in here because I'd love to do this video again with all sorts of new things. Thanks again for watching, guys. And don't forget to check out the podcast, Stallman Podcast, on whatever podcast player you use. And I'll see you in the next video. Did I already say that? <laughs> anyway, bye, guys. Bye.